<laughs> All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for joining us uh, for this event that is run as part of the University of Leicester's Breaking Barriers Refugee Week. Uh, so this event, Responding to the Ukraine Crisis, a collaborative cross-university model of practice, uh, is almost our last event. We have one more tomorrow. Uh, my name is Pascal Roussel. I'm one of the organizers for Breaking Buyers, uh, and I'm joined today uh, by my colleague uh, Julie Umarova, who is in the background letting people in, uh, and Alex Palanak, who will uh, also be one of the speakers today, uh, but we're keeping an eye on any questions uh, in the chat um, in addition. Uh, so before we start, we just have a few housekeeping rules. Uh, so you will not be able to unmute yourselves uh, during this event. Uh, the reason for this is that this event is recorded and will be uploaded to YouTube uh, later. So we don't want you uh, to appear and then not want to be in the recording. Uh, so you can use the chat box if you have uh, any questions or comments, or if you have any issues or concerns, you can also send a private message to Julie uh, using the chat box. Uh, so please be kind and respectful. Uh, and um, again, this event is recorded and we will send you the link to the recording uh, probably a week or two after the end of Breaking Buyers Refugee Week. If you have any queries following this session, feel free to email us to sanctuary at le.ac.uk. So I will just uh, briefly go through the outline for today's events. Uh, so at first we'll be setting the context, then you will hear from three of the universities uh, that are part of this uh, model, um, the sponsorship model. Then you will hear uh, from a few students. We have a few testimonials. Uh, and then we'll look at how we can take this work forward. And finally, there will be time to answer any question that you have. All right, so now before uh, I pass over to our first speaker, uh, I will just briefly introduce who is joining us today. Uh, so we have Leonie Ansems de Ries from King's College London, uh, as well as Nicole Manel, who works with her. Uh, we will also hear from Alex Palanak, my colleague with Head of Sanctuary at the University of Leicester, uh, and of Jumar Johnson from the Open University. And now we'll pass over to Leonie, who will be setting the context for us. Thank you so much, Pascal. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you also for organizing the event and bringing us all together. Uh, so I'll say a little bit uh, first about the broader context around Ukraine and higher education. Um, and then I'll speak a bit more about some of the other issues as well that we'll be discussing today. Um, so um, it's estimated that sort of more than half of the people that are forced to leave Ukraine are children and young people. Um, and of course, that means that their education has been disrupted, and that includes higher education as well. So there are actually quite a lot of higher education institutions in Ukraine, about 800. Um, and sort of prior to the invasion, there were approximately one and a half million university students and 80,000 researchers studying and working in Ukraine. So that's really quite a lot. Um, and of course, some, you know, some are still there, some have moved elsewhere, um, some of them have moved uh, to the UK. And we'll be speaking about that today, how, how we've done that and how other universities can get involved in that as well. Um, so UK universities are providing uh, support in a variety of ways, for instance, by giving scholarships um, to uh, students from uh, Ukraine, as well as fellowships. Those are for academics. Um, there are also twinning partnerships um, that will be discussed today as well, various other initiatives. And um, the government's Ukraine sponsorship uh, scheme um, is kind of providing an opportunity for UK universities to put into action um, the UK higher education's kind of commitment to supporting displaced communities um, and their access to educational opportunities. And we'll, I'll speak more about that later on, what that actually entails. Um, but in very brief terms, um, 
since um, April last year, uh, so April 2022, uh, we've been working on this partnership. Uh, so that's King's College London, University of Leicester, Open University and Newcastle. So Newcastle can't be here today, unfortunately, but also part of the partnership. Um, and, and what we've done is developing a university sponsorship model to be able to resettle uh, people from the UK uh, to the UK and, and keep them engaged with their education and their research. Um, so that's what we'll be speaking about a bit more. Um, and what we're doing is also not just doing it now, but creating a model that can then also be used um, in other instances of forced displacement uh, so that we can scale, that we can adapt and it can be used again and again in the future. Right. So the university sponsorship model um, is this in very in very brief terms. Um, so what it means is that it, we, it sort of enables higher education um, institutions in the UK to govern to implement the government's Homes for Ukraine scheme. And I'm sure you've all heard of that. So the idea is that people can host Ukrainians in their house for six months or or, or longer, uh, sort of being matched, and then um, that you can uh, you can uh, support them uh, in the UK, and they'll be mostly living in your in your own house for that time. Um, and what we're doing um, as, as a partnership is doing that specifically uh, for students and academics from the Ukraine. And really with the aim of keeping them engaged with their studies and their research. Um, and what we do there is we use a relational matching process uh, to match um, hosts with their, um, in their communities uh, with guests. So um, that means that if we take a bit more time to make sure we get the right match and people don't end up getting homeless or, or uh, and so on, it also means we we train hosts, we've got all the safeguarding procedures in place and so on. So make sure that there's a dedicated team that can offer support um, to, uh, to everyone um, and also enabling us to learn from that process and then create that model. So I really want to sort of evaluate it um, and then and learn from it um, and also at the same time, so we're feeding into national, international policy making process as well. So we're in conversations with DLUC, uh, for instance, writers who are doing, uh, who have set up the Homes for Ukraine scheme um, to, to see how we can improve it, um, but also to see how it can feed into broader resettlement uh, and sponsorship processes that are going on in the UK that already exist in the UK and that may be, we may want to develop as well. And really what we want to do as Kings, I'll speak more about this later on as well, um, is to create higher education that safe and legal pathways for students and academics from across the world. So this very briefly is, is, is the model. Um, so we have um, there are different ways in which we have uh, matched uh, and sort of resettled and hosted. Uh, people. So some are sort of self-matched, but at the King's, uh, in sort of just speaking about the King's experience now, but the other universities in our partnership are doing doing uh, very similar things. Um, some students are, uh, or some uh, guests are self-matched, so people that are in the King's community and have done it through the Homes for Ukraine scheme, but we're still providing them with support as well. Um, and then some um, um, are matched kind of through the university connection. Um, so they are sort of coming through a connection, but not necessarily to uh, through a gateway that we've set up. So together with USP UK and Citizens UK, so two charities, we set up a matching portal. Um, and through that, people can apply from Ukraine they, and then they get matched um, with people in our communities. Um, and I'll speak more about this later, but we've been able to also um, create sanctuary scholarships and academic fellowships as well. So um, basically fund people to be able to continue their, their studies and research. Right, so um, now we'll speak a bit about uh, a bit more about what the sort of the three of the universities in our partnerships are are doing. So that's university sponsorships. So I'm going to speak a bit more. I'll speak about that first, and then we'll also hear from the Open University in Leicester because they also have various other initiatives and projects um, around Ukraine that they're working on. So. At King's, I've spoken a little bit about it already, um, about the uh, about the sponsorship model. Um, so we're doing this as part of the Sanctuary Hub. Um, and the Sanctuary Hub, really, uh, the idea there is that it is um, really bringing together this kind of more practical work that we're doing, as well as research and also kind of policy change. Um, and it's really based on a 
on a methodology of, of listening, co-creating with affected communities. So it's not just kind of scholars and um, and and a lot of staff at university saying this is what needs to doing, but really starting by listening to people that are affected and seeing what are the issues, what are the big questions, and how can we resolve those. Um, and I've spoken uh, in a bit about this already, but there's been kind of I'll, I'll speak more about that in on the next slide, but I just wanted to point out here, you see the university sponsorship and you see these three faces. So refugee community sponsorship scheme, homes for Ukraine, and then and then the model. Um, and, and all that sort of underpins by a, a, an approach that's community-based and, and kind of holistic in terms of support. Um, but yeah, if we can go to the next slide, then I can uh, outline this in, in a bit more detail. So as already mentioned, Sanctuary Hub is an innovative space for research, advocacy and policy development, and especially in the kind of the, the higher education sector. Um, and, and that includes the development of, of safe and legal higher education at Pathways. But I want to speak about that um, more uh, later on. I've already spoken about the kind of methodology of listening, relationship building and co-creation. So let me let me take you through that journey uh, of of how how we got to this this even this idea and and this practice uh, of 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 doing sponsorship because of course that's not something uh, that universities tend to do normally. Um, so where did that come from? Uh, so um, as Kings, um, we have been working on this since about 2016, 2017, I think, so quite a few years now. And we've been working together since our time with Citizens UK, the Home Office, and the UNHCR. Um, to become um, the first university in the UK to resettle a refugee family. So that's kind of what we were interested in doing. Um, and that came both from our practice in the sanctuary program, but also from our research that showed that actually very often people don't have access to safe and legal pathways to the UK. I mean, this issue is really hot at the moment in the UK as well. Uh, we'll be looking at the issue around uh, the small boats and also the new legislation that's being proposed. And of course, the big issue is that people don't have safe, often access to safe and legal pathways. So we were thinking, can we create those? Well, actually, they exist. Can we make them accessible for people that need them? And then we said, well, as a higher education institution, can we create a higher education, let's say, for legal pathway? So that's what we've been working on. And the first time we did that, so it was a long process, finally happened in 2021. We used the existing community sponsorship scheme, that's the UK government scheme, to resettle a family from Syria. Um, and the idea is that it's resettled through the UNHR. They have refugee status when I arrive in UK and then the community group which in this case was Kings takes over and supports them with everything they need access to education housing um healthcare and all that um and what we did with that is offer a scholarship to one member of the family uh, who's now studying engineering at Kings um so we're creating as a not just as a protection pathway um making sure that people are protected even in UK but also as a higher education pathway um, and what we've done after that is um, sort of the second stage of that of that process is to get all the universities involved to do the same thing. Um, and the invasion of Ukraine uh, kind of brought some urgency uh, to that, but also momentum because universities were interested uh, in doing that. So if we can move to the next slide and I'll speak a bit more about that. Um, so, um, so it's kind of three phases, resettling one family and then through homes for Ukraine uh, create uh, resettle a lot more uh, Ukrainians and uh, work together with other universities to do that, uh, but also create a model, right? And we've been able uh, to do that um, with scholarships as well, uh, due to a large donation uh, that we received. Um, and that is um, for students and, and academics impacted by the war in Ukraine. Um, and all our university partners kind of offer these scholarships to students at all levels, so undergraduate, postgraduate, PhD, um, as well as um, as well as fellows with um, a kind of uh, emphasis on STEM subjects. Um, and um, yeah, I'm not going to talk uh, too much about this, but we're working together with CARA as well uh, to kind of enable that as well to get to resettle um, uh, fellows there as well. Um, yeah, let's let's move on. Um, from that. Okay, so I will pass over to Jumana, who's going to speak about the initiatives at the Open University. Thanks, Leonie, and good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and to be sharing with you what we at the Open University have been doing in addition to being a part of the relationship with Kings and the uh, partnership. <clears throat> um, 
since Feb 2020, where are we now? 2023, 2022, um, the university has uh, committed itself to doing whatever is possible, given that ours is um, a unique distance learning model. So looking at how what we do could be relevant to um, those that are displaced, but also where their education has been interrupted and um, are in different countries. Um, I won't focus on everything that we've been doing, but I'll tell you a little bit more in addition to what Leonie's already covered. Um, we also have scholarships. Um, we have eight Ukrainian students currently on scholarships, uh, two CARA fellows. But I'd like to uh, tell you a bit more about the twinning program that we're a part of um, with the Cormac Consultancy Group. So we have two twins, uh, the Horolivka Institute for Foreign Languages and the Institute of Molecular Biology and Genetics. Uh, for the latter, we actually have one of our CARA fellows who is linked to them. Um, so we've been able to sort of create what that partnership with the Institute of Molecular Biology and Genetics will look like um, because she has first-hand knowledge and um, contacts. Um, with them, we're actually looking at uh, research initiatives. Um, we have uh, virtual STEM laboratories called Open STEM, so it's looking at how that could help um, with some of their work. Um, and then looking at um, whether the grant applications are possible. And in, in sort of similar ways with the Horlifka Institute, we're looking at how our languages provision maps across to theirs and whether there are things that they can lift and use um, through a distance learning model. But they are also more broadly, having been displaced three times now, uh, looking at moving into the online learning space um, and how they can support students in that model, having never really uh, run things that way. Um, I'll move on, but I'm very happy to obviously answer questions in this space. Uh, Pascal, next slide, please. Thank you. Um, the other thing that the university has uh, long experience in is free learning. Uh, so this, this is our sort of history with the BBC, co-producing content and then moving it into the free learning space, helping millions of people uh, do free learning we thought about what we could do pretty immediately um, when the crisis began. So we took a lot of our content, thought about uh, where it could be relevant for families coming into the UK, created content in that space, um, things like English, basic maths, uh, content for um, <clears throat> content on Ukrainian culture for families that will be, and uh, more broadly in the UK public, but even through our partnership with Kings, will be uh, hosting Ukrainian families. So there is something on culture and languages in that space. Um, and then moved from that into looking at how we would be able to um, provide free learning specifically in Ukrainian. Um, so a lot of our content, relevant content that we knew uh, from our analytics that was being looked at was then translated into Ukrainian. We've now got additional content about to be released as well. Um, Again, unsurprisingly, uh, we've been asked several times to talk about the online learning model itself. Um, so how do you um, do online learning? How do you create communities? How do you support students? So we hosted uh, a free webinar with some of our academic experts in this space in partnership with the Ministry of Education and Science. And uh, nearly half of the ATIs in Ukraine were a part of that. So we actually had something like 1,200, um, even though it says 820 participants here, but we had about 1,200 people altogether um, that tapped into uh, that webinar. And currently there is a sort of free uh, FAQs resource that goes with that webinar. And we're talking about doing some more within that space, taking those conversations ahead. Um, so lots of foot. Um, I'm also very happy to share if anyone is interested in the free learning resources, or you could just go to Open Learn uh, and then find it that way. But happy to put it into the chat or for anyone to email me later. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, so um, my name is Alex Palanak um, and I'm from the University of Leicester. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about what we've been offering. Um, so first of all, in terms of scholarships and fee waivers, um, we've been offering places on face to face degree programmes as part of what Leonie mentioned earlier, um, the university sponsorship model um, funding. Um, we're also offering Ukraine conflict distance learning scholarships. 
So these are um, offered to students of any nationality who have been detrimentally affected by the Ukraine conflict. And we specifically wanted to open it up to students from any nationality because we realised that there were um, many students, for example, from African and Asian countries who were also displaced um, by the Ukraine conflict. Um, another thing that we're offering is places on a refugee programme. So this is basically an online academic English programme um, because um, we know that, that many people who might want to access a degree programme may not necessarily have the level of academic English necessary to do so. So um, this is one way in which we can support students with that. Um, another thing that we've been doing is hosting. Um, so many of our staff are hosting under the Homes for Ukraine scheme. We also have two British Academy funded researchers at risk with us on a two on two year fellowships. Um, so um, here you can see a picture of Dr. Inessa Kostenko. So she, she is one of the, the fellows on this scheme. Um, she's a senior lecturer um, from the VN Kazarin Kharkiv National University, and she's currently working in our School of Law. We also have um, four students from Kremenchuk National University with us at the moment for one semester in Leicester. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that on the next slide. So, um, so we currently have two um, twinning part partners. Um, so we've already twinned with Kremenchuk University and um, that agreement was signed last de December. And we're just in the process of signing an agreement with Poltava Agrarian State University as well. So I'm just going to give you a few examples of some of the, the twinning activities that we've been doing um, with these universities. So as I mentioned just now, um, we currently have four students here and you can see them um, in this photo um, for one semester in Leicester. Um, we've also been offering online English language classes and training for staff and students at these universities. Um, we've also supported um, with the design and the equipping of an underground teaching facility. We've been uh, providing training for practitioners on the psychological trauma and impact of war on students and providing clothing for students who, who might have lost access to their support networks due to conflict casualties. We've also been submit, submitting collaborative research funding bids um, with each of our partner universities. And we're in the process of discussing and developing possible dual degree programs at postgraduate level too. Um, also, um, Poltava academics are providing online seminar classes for University of Leicester students in the School of Law um, in order to provide them with a different perspective on European law. Um, so you can see that, that these partnerships are kind of working both ways. Um, so now um, I'm going to, we're going to hear from um, so the four students who you can see in this photo. Um, they've each provided us with a short testimonial, which um, my colleague Pascal is going to, to read out just now. Thank you, Alex. Uh, so, yeah, so we have four testimonials from the students. So the first one is Yeva, who said, our tutors here are really kind and make us feel like we are just normal students. They are also really patient with us because sometimes we will talk for some time about the situation in Ukraine. We feel it is our duty not to be silent, but to raise awareness. We also have a testimonial from Kira. Leicester is quite different. I feel totally safe here. We hope the war will end as fast as it can. Ukraine is still standing after a year. We have another testimonial from Alexandra. I'm still trying to get used to it, and I am scared of getting used to this because I want to go back home. My family and friends are still there. So while it is amazing to be in Leicester, it's still very hard. And finally, from Karina, I've seen lots of Ukrainian flags across the city, which is cool. It makes me feel at home. It makes me feel supported. And then I will pass on to Nicole from King's College London. Uh, we will tell us how we can take this work forward. Thank you, Pascal. 
So we're really keen um, to continue to support students and academics who are impacted by the war in Ukraine and, and one way that we can do that in addition to um, all of the other initiatives that um, you've heard about today is through university sponsorship and um, but to do that we we do need more hosting partners um, and also hosts from university communities. Um, so there is the opportunity, if you would like to, to be involved in the university sponsorship model as a higher education partner. Um, and our partner universities also have the opportunity to join the Sanctuary Hub, which Leonie spoke about um, in some detail um, today. So what the partners can offer um, is resources to support the scheme, including access to the University Gateway, which Leonie spoke about. So this is a portal that we've developed with Citizens UK and Ukrainian Sponsorship Pathway UK to match Ukrainian students and academics who are in need of sponsorship to come to the UK um, to find safety and continue their academic journey journeys. Um, we also have um, numerous training materials that we've developed in partnership over the last year, which includes um, information about all aspects of the hosting process and also safeguarding training, um, as we realise this has been um, an important area of the work. We also bring all of these materials together in the Sanctuary Programme Resource Hub, which is an online SharePoint site with all of the information that you'd need and links to external web pages. Um, we also have regular partner meetings. So we've learned a lot from each other over the last year and the many initiatives that we've been involved in have fed in and helped us develop the university sponsorship model. So you'd you'd be joining a consortium of universities um, and it's it's been a real privilege to work in partnership in this way. Um, and as, as I mentioned, you'd also have the opportunity to join the Sanctuary Hub. And this is an opportunity to be part of and shape collaborative research, advocacy and policy development so that we can think about that bigger picture and the development of formalized higher education led pathway pathways for displaced students and academics from across the world. Um, one thing that has come from the situation um, in Ukraine is a greater awareness of the need to support displaced students and academics from all areas of the world. Um, and what we've learned through the university sponsorship model, we really want to put into developing um, other ways that we can support those impacted by conflict and persecution. The commitment that would be required from those who are interested in joining the partnership um, is to have support from your senior leadership at your university, a willingness to host and support a number of Ukrainian students and academics or other university staff, and the structures and resources to implement the scheme. So this can include financial resources, dedicated sanctuary team or equivalent, um, and volunteers to provide holistic support for students and academics to, to really settle within your university communities. Um, and we saw how important that is, for example, for the students from Leicester, uh, who we've just heard testimonials from. Um, and finally, a willingness to evaluate and learn from the experience so that we can share learning. And as I've said, contribute to the development of higher education led pathways for displaced students and academics. Um, and we realised today was a very brief introduction, so we've provided some useful links and resources so that you can find out more. Um, so we have published an article on the King's web pages about the university sponsorship model. Um, so you can read a little bit more about how that works in practice. Um, also to mark uh, the one year anniversary of Ukraine, Leonie and I wrote a wonky article um, about that wider ambition that we have to share the learnings and, and develop formalized higher education led pathways um, in response. Um, Leicester also have their free online self access trauma informed ESOL for refugee materials. Um, and um, we haven't included the link here, but Juma um, has outlined in detail the various online resources from the Open University. And I'm sure that we can include those links for you as well. 
Um, and we, we really don't want people to forget about the experiences of those impacted. So we've also included links to the recent BBC article about the University of Leicester students' experiences. Um, and during um, the, to mark the one year anniversary, a sanctuary scholar from King's, Alina Sotnik, shared her experience of studying at King's whilst juggling a ministerial role um, um, in Ukraine. So she's been splitting her time between London and Ukraine, and we've massively benefited from having her within our community. Um, and finally, if you would like to know a little bit more about the university sponsorship model, um, please do join us for a webinar on the 29th of March. This will be an opportunity to learn a little bit more in detail about how it works in practice and um, the support that's available. And most importantly, to give you the opportunity to ask us, us any questions. Um, so that's all from me. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you all. All right. Uh, well, Nicole has just mentioned answering your question. So now is the time. If you do have any questions for any of our speakers, please put them in the chat box. Uh, we will give you uh, a couple of minutes to, to do that. Also, if you have any comments, doesn't have to be questions, but any idea that spring to mind or suggestions of other things uh, we could do. All right, we have one question that has come through. Um, so let me read it to you. Uh, it is really impressive and inspiring to hear all about the work you have been that has been done to support Ukrainian students and academics and to collaborate with Ukrainian institutions. But there are sanctuary students from many of the countries who do not currently benefit from such schemes. How can we extend this model to displace learners from countries who often have hostile governments? Don't know if anyone wants to have a go at that complex question. Um, I'm happy to, Pascal. Thank you. Um, yeah, so absolutely, we're we're very aware that um, there are many um, individuals imp impacted by conflict, persecution, but also increasingly environmental de degradation as well, um, who are in need. And um, from the outset of setting up the university sponsorship model, we were really keen to be thinking, how can we evaluate this work um, in order to, as I said, feed into the development of safe and legal education led pathways. And this work had, had been happening already. So um, Leone spoke quite briefly, but from 2016, King's College London had been looking at how we could become community sponsors. And our focus uh, was actually on Syria at the time um, due to um, the, the large numbers of people who have been displaced from Syria due to conflict. So the first phase of us looking into university sponsorship actually focused on that region. And the idea was always to think about how we could develop a model that we could share with other higher education institutions 
that could be replicated. Um, and the idea was we would support one student and their family, but we would help many of the universities to do the same. And then the numbers would, in, would hopefully increase over time. Um, and we'd, we'd also been in conversations with other international universities as well, uh, particularly in Canada, because they have um, a really impressive history of sponsorship and support for sanctuary scholars. So um, we, we were working on this at the time, we'd engaged with around 15 universities. And then when the invasion of Ukraine happened, it meant that um, there was a really urgent need to respond and that that's how the Homes for Ukraine University sponsorship model came about. So Leone gestured to this, it didn't happen in a vacuum, we'd been working on it, we'd started thinking about what we could achieve in the future. But what's interesting about the, um, the situation with Ukraine is that the, the Homes for Ukraine scheme provided a method that people could get to safety quite quickly. Um, so we're also looking at that and that has provided um, evidence of how people can access safe and legal pathways, but we're really interested in that educational element um, and uh, not to, I know I'm probably sound like a broken record but we are evaluating we are looking at how we can extend this model to support displaced students and academics from across the world um, and ensure that they can continue their academic journeys and fulfill their potential thank you Nicole I don't know if anyone else uh, want to add anything uh, to this, otherwise we have a few more questions that have come through in the chat. All right, I think I will move on to the next question. Uh, so, uh, can I ask if the university sponsorship scheme is aimed at those who are ready to start a degree program uh, and have relevant qualifications uh, like a CELTA IELTS or other things? Um, do you want me to? Uh, yes, please, Leonie. <laughs> um, yeah, sorry for, for running off for a minute. And thank you, uh, Nicole, for um, answering the question. Um, yes, yeah, so it um, at the moment, um, it is, so in the first the first sort of, uh, of a settlement we did, that was someone who was ready to go into higher education who had already done a foundation degree in Lebanon. Um, so had all those qualifications and I was able to, to go forward. Um, with the Ukraine model, um, it can be both. Uh, so it can be uh, people that uh, are ready to go into, uh, into university, um, have English language and all the other things. Um, it could be that they may need to do a foundation year first, right? So that's an option. Uh, it could also be that um, they are, for instance, uh, students in, um, in, in Ukraine, um, but uh, you know, may need to reorient themselves. So the the idea in that case, we we can bring them over to the UK first, and then and we can just see what the what the best way forward is. And it may be that learning English is the first step, uh, right? And getting the qualification is the first step. And then after that, we can look at going into university more formally. Thank you, Leonie. Um, all right, so next one, we have uh, something from Ambrose. Thank you, excellent information. Could you please say a little more about your respective university sanctuary teams activities and how it is constructed, please? Uh, who would like to start? Uh, Alex, do you want to talk a little bit about our structure at Leicester? Yeah, so at Leicester, we have a, a sanctuary seekers unit. Um, so we have kind of two full-time members of staff and a couple of members of staff who do some sanctuary work as part of that. And then we have a, a big team of volunteers um, uh, uh, who, who are kind of involved in lots of different um, activities. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I'm head of sanctuary. And then we have Julie here, um, who is sanctuary program administrator. And then we have Pascal, who is um, who's business um, administration administrator is that right or manager <laughs> and she and she has um she is involved in sanctuary activities as part of her role and so is um Phil Horsepool um and so yeah what what do we do so we a lot of our work is um involved in widening participation to higher education through English language pathways um because we know that English language particularly academic English can be a big um a big 
barrier to people who, who can't access provision. So we provide um, we provide um, free English classes, informal English classes, as, um, alongside a local charity, Less City of Sanctuary, and then we also provide free places on various different English language programmes, including pre-sessional academic English, occupational English tests for requalifying medics, and then we've also now developed the Refugee programme, which is English for academic purposes online um, for refugee background students around the UK. Um, so we have a few different things going on with that. And then we've been developing um, trauma-informed um, pedagogy, kind of um, some um, kind of methods um, that teachers can employ in the classroom, um, bearing in mind trauma. Um, also, we have like a variety of uh, sanctuary scholarships um, for degree level programmes that we offer. And then kind of running events like this to basically raise awareness of the different activities that that we and other universities across the sector might be offering and how people can get involved. Um, I've probably missed out a lot of stuff. <laughs> a lot of stuff. Pascal, could you think of anything else that I've missed? Uh, I suppose one thing I would like to mention uh, is one thing that's important um, in terms of being a university of sanctuary is that uh, you need to learn about the different challenges uh, students from refugee backgrounds are encountering and try to find solutions. But then you also need to embed that knowledge and those practices within every layer of the university. So I think a big part of our work as well uh, and of this kind of events is to share that knowledge and also to maybe sometimes challenge uh, some processes which, you know, may become big obstacles for for students think of okay if they can't prove their qualifications for instance can we put something else in place some sort of alternative assessment interview that will still allow them to universities even though obviously they maybe were not able to run away with their certificates and transcripts or maybe they are not able to get access to them anymore because you know their university isn't there or they don't have they are not able to to provide that information uh, that's just one small example uh, but that's an important one uh, something that can be quite challenging for any student from any applicant from refugee background when they are applying to university uh, and it's not always easy to identify them through like UCAS for instance uh, so yeah just just a small things and um, yeah we we've also had different initiatives but you can find a lot of information on our web pages, which we have been uh, revamping. Uh, and Juma wants to take her turn, so please, Juma. <laughs> Thanks, Pascal. Um, it's very different at BOU in some ways to Leicester and Kings, who have dedicated sanctuary hubs. Um, we don't have that. Um, as chief of staff, I'm responsible for uh, all our Ukraine response. Look, our equality, uh, diversity and inclusion uh, portfolio also sits within the vice chancellor's office and they're responsible for all of the work that we're doing under sanctuary more broadly. So at some point, everything that we're doing with Ukraine will kind of get pulled into that piece of work. So I keep everything together and then I have the most wonderful colleagues uh, and a colleague who is um, seconded over to me as the senior project manager who actually does all of the work actually I'm taking the credit by saying I keep it all together I don't she does um so we have a very different structure so as and when opportunities arise we then go back into the university to find the right kind of colleagues but we also keep a track of everything that is going on in the university that can feed into the broader sanctuary work or that could become a response um, specifically to the Ukraine crisis maybe one day we'll be as structured um, as Leicester and Kings are with the Sanctuary Hub. But at the moment, it's sort of, at least the university community knows there is a central point and there are people who are involved, but then we pull in as and when needed. Thank you, Jumar. Um, Leonie or Nicole, do you want to mention a little more about your Sanctuary Hub and activities? Yeah, I think I can just, um mentioned kind of our three sort of priorities um, that kind of covers the broad area um, of, of what we do. So first is uh, kind of sort of access to higher education and sort of helping uh, 
supporting uh, forced migrants to thrive in higher education. Um, and that is kind of at the national level, it's sort of in the UK, um, it's scholarship and so on, but that's kind of also internationally and, and sort of also programs that work abroad um, to um, support uh, students and academics uh, to sort of higher education there. Um, and then the second strand is around safe and legal pathway. So we have spoken about that already and, um, and sort of bringing together the research and policy and advocacy there. Um, and the third strand is around the hostile environment. And this is something that we um, through, we keep seeing and, um, and experiencing ourselves as well. That's is a lot of the work that we're trying to do um, is, is being hindered in some way uh, due to the kind of policies and practices uh, that are that are at play uh, in, in a broader hostile environment, whether it's in higher education more generally. Um, so it's something that we're trying to work on as well. And I don't know if I can cheekily pass on if Sabrina wants to say a few words about the work internally at King. She's done around this because I think it's really interesting. But I don't know, Sabrina, I don't want to put you on the spot <laughs> if you are uh, still on the call. I'll need to unmute you in that case. Sorry, any anyone with not uh, the speakers will not be able to unmute themselves. So uh, pretty. We can't put people in spot like this. <laughs> no worries. In, in that in that case, so I think some of the work that um, that Sabrina has has led um, at at Kings is, is really great. So it is kind of a, a, a sort of an, an, an operations group um, internally at Kings is bringing together all the different um sort of departments and so on um that are involved in one way or another so whether that's kind of to do with admissions whether that's to do with student finance all these things bringing them all together and sort of looking at all the processes and practices at kings where there may be barriers where we can coordinate better and so on so it's also thinking about internally the, sort of the way in which kings operates um and and the culture at kings that um that need to be looked at and and, and where we can make improvements and changes as well so i think it's also good as as universities not just just look out but also to look in thank you leonie yes that's completely reinforcing what i was saying earlier i just gave a small example but yeah we should look at everything that we do all our practices processes and identify buyers and try to to break those uh, all right, so we have uh, a comment from Gary, um, a really useful and insightful presentation. Thank you all. I'd be keen to follow up and have a more detailed chat about Queen Mary's current work in this area and how we might engage with the university sponsorship model. So clearly the session is already having an impact. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, if um, I could very quickly respond to that. Thank you, Gary. That's great. We are in conversations with Queen Mary, so uh, it would be really great to, to link everyone up uh, on that. So uh, yeah, please get in touch. Fantastic. Uh, and a comment from Hina. Um, thank you for today's session. The current news cycle um, regarding displaced people has been incredibly upsetting. So ha it has been refreshing to hear the work you are doing, especially in relation to safe and legal pathways. Keep up the great work. Yes, absolutely. The news have been very upsetting. So let's keep on working to create those paths. All right, um, I think, let me see, do we have any more questions? I do not think so, a few more uh, comments uh, and thank you. Um, if there are no more questions, uh, I think uh, we will close this session a little bit early, uh, but thank you massively to everyone, to our speakers who took time in their very busy schedule to join us today uh, and to everyone who took the time to to attend.